This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third in a three-part series entitled Creating Retirement. My name is Nan Partlett, and I'm the director of the Emeritus College, and it is the Emeritus College which is sponsoring these uh, events. I'm glad to see so many familiar faces and also to welcome newcomers today. We have in our midst uh, several members, or more than several, uh, quite a few members of the Emeritus College. And I wish that uh, you would raise your hands just so we can know who you are, members of the Emeritus College. Good. Thank you. I am going to volunteer them, actually. I haven't asked, but I'm going to just do it. Uh, if you have questions about transitions uh, to retirement, I'm guessing that these folks would be uh, more than willing to talk about their own experiences in retirement. I want to draw your attention to several items today that you have in front of you on your um, desk. Uh, we have packets for you, uh, which include, uh, for today's session, creating or financial planning for a creative retirement. Uh, I especially like the graphic, and I think Charity Crabtree, who created it, um, can't hear me, but uh, I like this graphic. We have you know, money growing on a tree. Now, it is um, a bonsai tree, so I'm not quite sure what, what that symbolism is all about. But in any case, we're going to talk about, uh, our speaker is going to talk to you about financial um, matters in this whole concept of creating retirement. We have copies also of former, uh, the two former sessions, and those are available uh, for you at the registration desk. So if you missed session one or two and would like to have that, please pick up a packet as you, um, as you leave. I'm going to direct you back again to the money tree and also to ask you to be sure to notice our steering committee who is listed here. And I'm going to name these individuals. Um, and some of these are, uh, folks are here with us today. And if you would, when I call your name, if you just stand for a moment so we can thank you for the uh, considerable work and acknowledge the considerable work that you've done. We have uh, Bob DeHaan, who's chair of the steering committee and Candler Professor of Cell Biology Emeritus. Joanne Dalton, a committee member, Professor of Nursing Emerita. Robin DeAndrade, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery. Emeritus, Ron Frank, Dean Emeritus of Gosueta Business School and Candler Professor of Marketing, and Rod Hunter, who's not here today, who, uh, who is Professor of Pastoral Theology Emeritus. So my thanks to all of you for your um, time and your effort and the thought that you've put into this. The final thing I want to point out to you in the packet is the evaluation form, and it's bright pink. So please uh, take time to complete this for us. And in doing so, you're really helping us to serve you better uh, in the future. Without further ado, I want to introduce, um, again, our steering committee member, Ron Frank, dean of the business school and active member of the Emeritus College. And Ron will, in turn, introduce our speaker for today. Thank you so much. Roger Ward is a partner in the wealth management firm of Tarpley and Underwood. He joined the firm about 13 years ago. Previously, he worked in the Atlanta office of Deloitte and Touche and served as the controller for Savannah Chatham Board of Education. He's been involved in many professional groups, including the personal financial planning section of the AICPA and the estate and financial planning section of the Georgia Society of CPAs. He's also served as an adjunct faculty member for the Department of Risk Management and Insurance at Georgia State, teaching a course in personal financial planning. He's a Master's of Science in personal financial planning, a licensed CPA, earned his designation as a personal financial specialist. Lives in Roswell, 
member of the Roswell Methodist, United Methodist Church. His wife, Lolly, and he have a son and daughter. Now, in case you've got a stereotype of these CPA types, I, my wife isn't here today, so I can make that crack. She's a CPA uh, being conservative, and his financial planner is being conservative. I should tell you uh, that he and his wife, Lolly, took six months off and backpacked the Pacific Rim, Nepal, China, Indonesia. Uh, got that right as a country? Spent a little time in Singapore. Yeah, got to the right place. Um, uh, yes. Before I turn the podium over, uh, Ad Truth in Advertising compels me to say that Tarpley and Underwood have done our taxes since we came here in 1990. The firm itself started in 1987 uh, and subsequently have helped us in financial planning and the like. We did our first financial plans, I'm a zealot on this subject, 40 years ago. I'm 77. I think the best favor you can do for loved ones that are younger than you is encourage them to do their first round of financial planning. The earlier you do it, the more wiggle room you've got. You're fortunate if things turn out better, a little difficult if things turn out worse, and they never turn out the way the plan says they're going to turn out, so you've got to keep that kind of intellectual ball rolling, to say the least. It is my pleasure to introduce Roger Ward. Unfortunately, I guess I have to agree that uh, financial planners always get it wrong because you never get it right because you can't predict the future. Uh, I, I will admit to uh, one stereotype, and I'm going to cover this because I just realized it. The collating, uh, you have two uh, handouts in front of you. One relates to this, and then the other one is a bonus. If we ran out of time, it's, it's information that I did on a presentation uh, a few months ago, kind of recapping what's gone on the past couple of, year, uh, couple of years in the financial markets and what the implication is. But the, uh, the admission I must make is I just realized that this handout is not complete. You'll see slides that aren't in there. So I just talked to Charity, and if she had your name on the list, she's got your contact information, and I will email those out to you. So feel free to, to make notes on the other pages, but you will see things up here that are not in that presentation, so I apologize for that. It, 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 Dr. Frank is exactly right. The whole purpose of financial planning is to, I think, raise awareness. There is no perfect answer in financial planning no matter what age you're at, and I don't try to think of financial planning in retirement or financial planning, you know, when you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s, the, the world has changed so much that the importance of financial planning applies to everybody. And so that's kind of the, the, the background that I'll put behind the, the comments and observations that I'll make. In terms of questions, feel free to raise your hand and, and interrupt me as we go through. I think we've got plenty of time. If we don't, I may push a question off to the, to the end or to the side. So uh, appreciate your indulgence with that. Um, what we're talking about, retirement facts, just some interesting information how the world has changed with respect to retirement. What I see is the risks of retirement planning, regardless of where you're approaching it from, what are the risks to be aware of? Because it's the awareness of these risks that I think make the biggest difference in whether you get surprised or not, because it's the lack of awareness that causes problems down the road. The question we get asked a lot, how much is enough? Do I have enough to retire? Can I afford to retire? Am I okay? Am I gonna run out of money? The past two years, the crisis of 2008, did nothing to help answer that question the right way. And uh, quite frankly, it's challenged a lot of, about how financial planners look at trying to help answer that question of how much is enough. Asset allocation, we'll touch on the importance of thinking properly about asset allocation and not getting caught up with some of the rules of thumb that you might hear that in and of themselves aren't bad, they just may not be right. Um, I like thinking about the magic five years. That's kind of, if you get, as you're approaching retirement and into retirement, there's like a 10 year window, five years before, five years after. If you get your decisions made correctly for you in that period of time, you're pretty well set up to, uh, to do well in retirement. And then I have what I call my simple guide to retirement planning. Contrary to what anybody tells you, Retirement planning in and of itself should not be that difficult, but the financial services industry has done a tremendous, and the media, 
has done a tremendous job of making it seem more complicated than it is. I've, uh, one of the best things I found was this XM satellite radio. I didn't know that existed until I went off, my wife and I went to uh, Zion National Park and we ended up with a rental car that had it. And I was just amazed that you could get radio out in the middle of this desolate national park. So when I bought a car and it had it, I decided to keep it. Well, I also found that it has a CNBC and a Bloomberg channel on it. So I can't help myself. I listen to it and I'm just amazed at how many different reasons during the course of an eight-hour day that somebody can come up with as to why the market's up, why the market's down, it's Gaddafi, it's Charlie Sheen, it's oil, it's, I, I mean, after a while you just have to, to, to turn it off. And back when it was really bad in 2008, it, you know, it was, they were, they were live broadcasting on Sunday nights talking about what's going on in Asia because we thought the world was going to end and that's kind of the topic in the second uh, uh, round if we get to it. I think maybe we were close, but I think we're okay now. So we'll leave that just hanging out there. The retirement environment that we're in now is colored by these factors that we didn't have before. Longevity, the fact that demographically baby boomers are now, boom, this is it. I think it might have been mentioned in the last session. 2011, baby boomers turn, the first baby boomers turned 65 and then, you know, Every eight seconds, uh, there's a new baby boomer turning 65. So I did this uh, a few years ago, and at that time, they were turning 60 or 62. I forget what I used as the, the, the magic point. 62, I said, now they could apply for early Social Security or something. So I found, you know, so who are baby boomers that are turning 65 this year? And, you know, it's kind of surprising to think uh, uh, this is just the, the leading wave of who's turning 65. And, and this massive wave is really gonna color the conversation about how we as a country deal with some of these issues, but it highlights a point that a lot of us have to start thinking about, you know, what is retirement? The number of, of individuals who are in this age that we normally think of as retirement. And I'll tell you, I don't have a good age for retirement. Retirement's whenever you want it to be, and I think financial planning ought to provide you with the freedom to choose when that is. 65 is just what society and Social Security have, have forced us into talking about. So it's a, it's a number, it's, a, it's an age that we use. And the facts are there are more and more people following, falling into that, that, um, that time frame. I just like this chart. This is a chart from uh, a firm that, that uh, does global investing. And, and what it does is it puts the world into um, – patterns by the investable capitalization of that particular country. So as you would imagine, whoops, as you would imagine, U.S. is the big gorilla in the room. And what's always surprising, and this is about, this is a year old, China that we, we are so influenced by is still a relatively small player in the investable universe. But the point is, if we had done this 20 years ago, the United States would have been much bigger and there would have been very little going on in here. You would not have seen Brazil. You would not have seen China. You would not have seen India. The, the world is changing and globalization is going to color any conversation we have about retirement planning. I'm not going to talk about that, but I think it's a, a fascinating area for, for future discussion. Uh, several studies that I, when I go out and research this, say that as a... Um, as a group, we're less and less confident about our ability to retire. So when these surveys are done, uh, and these go through uh, 2010, what you find is retiree confidence in terms of being able to retire continues to, to shrink, you know, going from very com confident about retirement from in the 40s back in, in the last bull market of the stock market uh, down to around 20%. People are not very comfortable that they're doing what they need to do or are able to do what they need to do about retirement. I thought this was interesting. Um, the, the expectation as we go from back in 1991 to 2010, the expectation of continuing to work until 70 or older continues to increase. That's a function of a number of things. One, people feel more able to work later. They want to work later. And I think uh, there's just a financial need to work later. I'm going to skip through some of these. To Dr. Frank's point, when you do the surveys, 
most people do not try to calculate how much money they need to retire. They don't think through the issues that we're, we're talking about today, and I think that's a, uh, a mistake because you're not going to get a right answer. I'll admit that up front, but at least you'll get an answer and you'll have an awareness of perhaps gaps in your retirement plan. And a lot of this is not all financial. All the things you're talking about here, family dynamics, um, uh, estate planning, where are you going to live, all of these things come into the, the calculus of coming up with a, uh, uh, a successful retirement. It's not just all money, but money helps lubricate some of those other decisions. So we want to talk about it. Um, when people have a better awareness of how much they need to retire, obviously, if they think about it, and they tend to end up with a higher number, which tells me that just that awareness makes you aware of the reality that it probably takes more to retire financially than intuitively you might like that number to be. And so um, sometimes people avoid financial planning because they just don't want to get the result, but I, I think that's a, a false psychic uh, savings. Workers who have done a calculation are more confident. Makes sense. You've got a better handle on, am I headed in the right direction? But it's, it's like doing your will and exercising. It's, it, it's difficult to do unless somebody on, kind on of that puts it. Yes, sir. Were the number amounts not just uh, total net worth or savings? Uh, net worth, ex uh, well, this is, this is retirement needs that. Um, the, the respondent said was needed. In other survey results, you're, you're typically looking to avoid, say, personal residence or non-investable assets. So it's not net worth, it's investable, spendable assets. And I will tell you, don't fool yourself into thinking, nobody does it anymore. They used to think because they had rising real estate values that they had a comfortable retirement coming to them, but nobody, nobody makes that assumption anymore. So there are some common responses when you have a discussion with somebody about hey, the, the numbers aren't looking right. What, what should I do? Uh, so you'll hear these responses. Work longer, spend less in retirement, or downsize. McKinsey did a study, I think this was in 2009, and what they found was the expectations pre-retirees have about what they are going to be able to do don't match up with reality. A full 40% of retirees forced to stop working earlier than they planned, largely because of things that they could not control. So the idea of working longer, I, some people will say, I'm just going to work till I die. That's my retirement plan. Sometimes you can't do that. So you don't want to leave that as the, as the only fallback position you have. Um, underestimating retirement needs. I was meeting with a client yesterday, and long-time client, uh, and they finally came in and said, you know what, we just need to take more money out. You know, can we do that? And they had a cushion built up, and we, we said that, and I told them I was doing this and, and, uh, today, and they said, so are you going to use us as an example of somebody who just spends too much money? I said, no, I mean, you're, you're, you're okay, but it's a common situation to get into where you go into retirement or you stop your regular income flows and don't know how much you really need to, uh, to maintain the lifestyle that you want to maintain. The difficulty is when you get into retirement, it's sometimes hard to spend less. Like you'll hear these rules of thumb about you're gonna spend a certain percentage of your pre-retirement income. Things like healthcare, relocation, um, family needs, really get in the way of using those rules of thumb. And what the survey showed was that a, a large number of the respondents had underestimated what they found their retirement spending needs to be. Now, you'll find, I'm not a big fan of budgets. I don't think you should budget. But thinking about at least the big buckets of what you want to be able to spend comfortably in retirement is a wise thing to do. Downsize. This used to be a big one. We're going to take our... Our, our real estate that we've had value in, sell it, take a portion of it, buy something smaller. Never seems to happen. It's almost, even if you want to downsize size-wise, you end up spending the same amount of money. And um, so you just don't, 
you just don't see this as being an answer to the problem of, you know, how do you find some margin in your retirement planning calculation. I like to think about these as, you know, the, the, the critical things that kind of bring this complex topic into focus, all right? So what I talk about are five retirement risks, and then these other numbers will become uh, obvious as we go through them. But the five retirement risks, longevity, inflation, excess withdrawals, being too safe, this is that asset allocation uh, conversation, and then healthcare risk concerns. So these are the risks that can destroy a retirement plan, quite frankly, even if you plan for it, but awareness of what these risks can mean can set you up to be able to avoid uh, some of at least the obvious mistakes. No, longevity for, I'm sorry? No, I was just saying, uh, considering the, the implication of these risks can set you up for at least avoiding the avoidable portion of the risk, but. Oh, sure. Longevity, inflation, excess withdrawals, being too safe, and healthcare concerns. And we'll go through each one of these in order. I don't think it's any surprise that longevity has increased, but the degree to which it has increased has been pretty dramatic, and there was probably conversation about that in the last session. What I like to focus on, though, is what's that implication for retirement planning? It used to be you didn't have to plan for a long retirement. The lack of longevity took care of that, uh, for better or worse. But what we're finding now, and I'll show this two different ways, and, and I'm gonna, I'll jump over to the, to the, the graph because I think it's easier to see this. What this is saying is for a, a couple, if you have a, a man and woman who are both 65, from an actuarial standpoint, these are the percentages that either the man or the woman or at least one of them, the probability that they'll be alive to, 70, to, to these ages here. So 80, 85, 90, 95. So, you've got a 25% chance that at least one of those 65-year-olds will live to age 96. We didn't have that before. That was not a, um, a factor that had to be considered from a, a financial planning standpoint. So for professionals in the, the planning business, the implication is, yeah, I could say I'm gonna build a plan or an expectation to this 50% probability that you know we're, we're going to live somewhere in the late 80s, but the reality is we need to be pushing it out into the mid 90s because it doesn't. If you're if you're working for a man and a woman, a spouse and a husband, you know, a husband and a wife, you, you don't want it to work for only one of them. You want it to work for both of them. So the awareness of that reality is one of the big changes that we didn't have you know, even 10 years ago. And I think this will only get to be a, a bigger issue as healthcare changes, you know, make that number go out more. So that's where the 30 come, comes from. You want to plan with a 30 year time horizon in terms of retirement. Um, using that 65 year retirement age, you ought to plan on being able to uh, financially make it out to age 95. Used to be there was also a, a, a financial planning objective. You know, you'd ask, so how much do you want to leave for the next generation for the kids? The response to that one just isn't the same as it used to be. It's like, I, as long as I can get through, you know, my retirement, the kids can take care of themselves. I just don't want to leave them a burden and, you know, that, that's enough. So uh, that's part of this longevity situation as well. Inflation risk. I'm sorry. Oh, we'll come back to that one. That, that relates to healthcare costs. So this is just going to those, those uh, numbers that we need to know. We've got five retirement risks. We've got a 30-year time horizon that we want to plan for, and then we'll, we'll work our way down to the other numbers. 
So risk number two, as it plays into this, because of the longevity, is inflation. Inflation used to not be as big of a concern because we didn't have to worry about a long retirement. So these are, these are related in that if you've got to make a retirement plan last for 30 years, you can't ignore the effects of inflation. So you can look at it a couple different ways. Uh, $100,000 today with a 3% inflation factor, your purchasing power after 20 years almost cuts in half what that $100,000 is, um, is able to buy for you. So you can't take a, um, a cavalier approach and as long as you're creating, say that were the right level of income, say you're creating that level of income, if you don't have any provision for growth of the underlying asset that's creating that income and you just keep creating that same nominal amount of $100,000 a year, at some point, it's not going to be enough to maintain the lifestyle that you're planning for. Just another way to look at it in terms of dollars, $100,000 after 30 years, $40,000. Now, right now, inflation is pretty benign. Um, uh, CPI, you know, is less than 3%, but the long-term average is 3%, and so I think that's a, a fair number to use. So it's sometimes easy to think about it in terms of, of an example, um, something everybody deals with. Uh, in 1979, which was 31 years ago, postage stamp was 15 cents. In uh, 2010, 44 cents. Annual increase of 3.5%. Roughly matches that, that increase in inflation. Um, <coughs> Inflation's insidious. You don't know where it's going to pop up, but it's pretty safe to say it's going to be popping up in things that you need to spend in retirement. And we'll talk about it, you know, briefly in a little while. In certain areas like healthcare, it's even worse. So at a minimum, we need to be taking into account some level of inflation. Now, from an investment standpoint, we try to think about returns from a real return standpoint. And what we mean by real return, over long periods of time, stock market roughly averages around 95 to 10%. Um, bonds, roughly around 5.7%. But when you lay on top of that, this 3% inflation factor reduces your return fairly dramatically, lay taxes on top of that, which is different for everybody, even worse, and if you're trying to be too safe and you're here in cash, you're actually ending up with negative real returns, so you can't stay ahead of that inflation burden that's going to insidiously start working its way into your retirement budget. So inflation has a real impact on, on how we should think about positioning for retirement. So just keep that in mind. All right. The overspending, the way we think about overspending is really taking too much out of the nest egg or excess withdrawals. It's you know, how much can you take out without imperiling the longevity of the portfolio. And so it is that how much is enough question just flipped around. Well, how much can I take out? And if the amount I can take out is enough, then I've got enough. If it's not, well, I don't have enough. When you ask this question in, in surveys, People tend not to get this one right. And, and some of this, I say, goes back to when we started, when I started with Tarpley and Underwood and in this profession in 1998, it was a terrible time to start in this profession. The stock market was going up, but when you would come out and say, you know what, you need a balanced portfolio of stocks and bonds and all this, and they would go, are you crazy? The S&P is going up 25%. I can go up 25% a year, take out 10% a year. I'll never run out of money. And that works fine until you know, the market crashes. So there's a reason why you think about what the right withdrawal rate is, and it's not just the return on the portfolio, it's something else. So what you're looking for is a sustainable withdrawal rate. And sustainable means that given the longevity that we're concerned about, you position assets in such a way that if you take out a certain amount, it's gonna last for the period of time that you need. So 
we're thinking in terms of, of a long period of time, 30 years. So what you can look at is different allocations, mixes of stocks and bonds, and what's a supportable withdrawal rate. And you'll see different, I, got, I have different versions of this, so don't get too, don't get too caught up on the, the, the allocation. Look for the theme, and the theme is you can't necessarily be as safe as you would like to be in positioning your investments, and you can't have a withdrawal rate that is unsustainable over a long period of time. And the reason you can't just say, if I'm earning 10%, I can take out 10%, I'll be okay, you know, in a, a no-tax world even, let's, let's ignore that, is the problem is timing. It's when do you get those returns, because they do not come in a straight line. So these were the actual return experience If you retired in, with $500,000 in 1973, and this was one of the worst periods of stock market returns that we had, the, the high inflation period of the 70s and into the early 80s. And so what would happen is those, those negative return uh, results that you had early on kept the portfolio from being able to maintain itself and eventually the portfolio just would collapsed in on itself. But if you just took that sequence of returns and flipped them around, you end up with a much different picture. And the problem is you don't know when returns are going to, to, to show themselves positive or negative. You have to take a position that I'm going to structure a withdrawal plan and I'm going to structure the allocation so I can deal with both. It, it, it's a, it's kind of walking the middle of the road uh, answer to, to trying to deal with uncertainty. Does this chart on the right reflect what you would need in order to produce a given amount? No. No. This is, this is showing, it's taking the actual returns that occurred over this period of time and flipping the order of them to just show that if you had been unlucky enough to, in, to retire <coughs> at a period of time that you got a negative return experience versus somebody who was lucky enough to retire when you got a positive return experience, it, 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 it's almost um, a bad luck of the draw, quite frankly. But you can mitigate being a victim of that by taking some of these conservative measures like keeping a reasonable withdrawal rate. Um, What this is showing is the, the probability of success with different withdrawal rates. Same, same allocation, but different withdrawal rates. And what you see is, as you increase even by 1% that withdrawal rate, your probability of having a portfolio last over the entire lifetime of a retirement decreases dramatically. The difference between 4% and 8%, quite frankly, means a high likelihood of, re of retiring successfully versus almost a, a, uh, an extremely unlikely uh, opportunity to retire successfully. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. then uh, we've already decided that he or she is only likely to live, certainly not likely to live uh, until he's 100 or she's 100, uh, which would, or, well, 95, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't need nearly as much, obviously, because your time horizon is now so short. Well, the, the, the idea is that when you're looking at these probabilities, you're using Monte Carlo simulation to simulate a range of those different returns that could happen. If we say you want to make it out to 30 years, say at 65, you want to make it out to 95, the likelihood of having a successful outcome if you have a higher level of withdrawal 
drops significantly if you increase that withdrawal rate. So these are probabilities. Probabilities, that's correct. So that's where I come up with this 4.25. They're actually, it's, it's kind of um, uh, to say 4.25 is the magic percentage for a withdrawal rate. It almost gets into that rule of thumb area. If you want to simplify it, say 5%. For every million dollars, $50,000 of, of withdrawal is probably supportable over a uh, reasonably long period of time. 4.25 comes from some academic work by, done by a uh, gentleman named Bill Bergen who did a lot of testing to come up with, with that 4.25. And you find in different scenarios, trying it different ways, and watching it over time, it's not a bad, uh, it's not a bad rule of thumb to use. So that's where the 4.25 comes from. That's a percentage that you should be able to take off of a diversified nest egg and have it last for this 30 year period of time that we're trying to, uh, trying to target for. And, and then what are the assumptions about how much you got left at the end, whatever the end? Well, the, the assumption here is that you're just not running out of money. I mean, the probability is a failure being below zero. So you're not targeting anything left over. You're targeting not to have zero. You can always, you can complicate the planning scenario by saying, I don't want to target zero. I want to target something above that and adjust your, uh, adjust your assumptions. Risk four, being too safe. This is the asset allocation discussion. If you lay on top of that withdrawal rate, how you invest, you start getting different views of, of that probability of success again that start getting you to where you need to be thinking about how do you position your nest egg in retirement. And I'd argue this is ultimately for all the smoke and mirrors that the financial services world likes to, uh, to, to put on it, this is kind of the crux of what you're trying to get at. What's the right amount that I can take out and how should I position my, my uh, portfolio? The easy thing to see, I think, is if you start getting that withdrawal rate certainly too much above this 5% level, you can't just sit in an all-bond portfolio. You've got to have some exposure to assets that will stay ahead of inflation. Stocks, and there's a simplified example. You can obviously break this up into a bunch of different ways, but if we just look at stocks and bonds, your likelihood of success as you have a higher withdrawal rate definitely increases as you start adding some stock exposure. Now, interestingly enough, you can see there's kind of a point of diminishing returns where 100% stocks and the lowest withdrawal rate is actually less than 75% stocks and 25% bonds uh, where it's 92%. That's the diversification impact that comes from not having all of your eggs in one basket. But the point is you can't be too safe and have a reasonable level of being able to last for that, that long retirement period with a reasonable withdrawal rate. Does that make sense? Because, yes, sir. Um, I think it's a reasonable guess on my part that the vast majority of people in this room have a, a significant, if not the major part of their retirement assets in TIAA credit. Mm -hmm. It, you, any, any annuitization uh, element of the, or even potential annuitization element of a portfolio is really the, is, is a bond proxy. Uh, think of it that way. The CREF portion is the stock portion, the TIAA, and it can vary as how you get it out of there, is really the bond portion of the portfolio. Uh, yes, sir. No. No. No, you don't. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying is the structure of the investments that underlie that, you can have different distribution they're options. They're, they're, they're more bond-like, fixed income-like than they are um, uh, uh, stock-like. History, 
when you look back and say, what were the sustainable withdrawal rates for the different uh, um, uh, levels of allocation? So 2%, 4%, 6 8 so on. You actually do have periods of time, and you can see the periods that, that were we're looking at, you do have periods of time, 30 year periods of time, where you could have a relatively high withdrawal rate. The, the problem is it's, the probability is just not going to be high enough that you're going to be lucky enough to be retiring in advance of one of these bull market periods that would allow you to have that high withdrawal rate. What's the downside of a low withdrawal rate? you might end up with too much money when you die. And that's not something you necessarily target for, but it's better than the alternative. Okay. Yes, sir. These data are calculated and you generalize X bonds, X percent bonds, Y percent stocks. Would that be equivalent to a total stock market index fund versus a total it's a, reason, it's a reasonable proxy. A reasonable these, these are going to be, um, I believe this one's looking at... Um, We're not talking about picking and choosing stocks. No, no, no. The, the, the stock proxy here, I'm almost certain, is S&P 500, and the bond proxy is almost certainly um, um, uh, T-bills, or not T-bills, but Treasury bonds. Um, it, but what you find is if you complicate try to complicate it by putting in different asset classes and different types of bonds, you tend to come up with the same relative answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? Now, are expense ratios for these investments included in the calculation? No. Like I say, these, these are index numbers. So that's a, a very important point. I'll, I'll put my bias out there. My, my, my bias is that you get a better investment experience by keeping your expenses low which pushes me to always say a passive investment approach is better than an active, expensive investment approach. Because if these are index returns and the studies in history show that active management that adds expense doesn't improve the performance, all this does is shift everything down. No, I don't think that's a bias unless you and I both have the same bias. <laughs> well, Right. But, but I guarantee you I could find plenty of people standing up right now who would say differently because they do have a bias. So. If I was a stockbroker, I would challenge Right. That's not uh, in, that, in that other presentation, I've got some uh, the, the statistics that show what percentage of active managers beat their benchmark. And, you know, it's, it's a low percentage relative to what the marketing would tell you to do. Yes, sir. Yeah, the uh, one of the best things I, I read recently by a, uh, I say colleague, he's in the same same, uh, he's an advisor with a, a firm. They use all all passive or indexed uh, approaches, and he he the book just came out. I think it's called Searching for Alpha, which is over performance, and he has kind of a Q and A in there, and he he responds to the question, well, what about Warren Buffett? And his response is, if you get up in the morning and look in the mirror and you see Warren Buffett, you do whatever you want. <laughs> Otherwise, I recommend you use index funds. And uh, Taking that, that, uh, that stamp analogy just a little bit farther to compare it to risk assets, not recommending everything in risk assets, but we sometimes lose a perspective. The S&P 500 in uh, 1979 was at 107. At, at December 31, it was 12.58. So that period of time where we had the, the, the inflation or 193% of increase in cost, we had 1,076% increase in the risk asset index over that same period of time. It's, <clears throat> this is the reason why you, and I, like I say, I'm not, I'm not saying you need to have 100% in stocks. I'm not going anywhere near there, but the point is, you can't stay ahead of this 
by staying in all assets that are completely risk-free, particularly now this, when um, fixed income assets are earning such a low yield. So 60-40, this is, this is definitely art, not science, but 60-40 is a split between stocks and bonds. And you could make that 50-50, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't you know, have a problem with that that says that type of mix is what supports this kind of withdrawal over a 30-year time frame. Um, if you start getting safer with this, you start impacting your ability to support that or to support that. One of them, something's probably going to have to give. Um, Yes, sir. Is this, if this is the advice you would give to a 60-year-old, mm -hmm. is it also the advice you would give to an 80-year-old? Uh, no, because the, the, the longevity is, is less at that point than for a 60-year-old. So there is, some, uh, there is some reason to get more conservative in a portfolio because you can afford to get more conservative. It doesn't have to last as long. See, the challenge we we have is we're trying to avoid the, the pain of the risk of volatility, but we're having to offset that with what I call the pain of the risk of impoverishment. And it's real easy to avoid the risk of the volatility of the stock market. You just stay out, and then you feel good when the stock market goes down, you feel a little bit bad when it goes up and you're not there. The, this negative experience of being impoverished, unfortunately, happens over such a long period of time. It sneaks up on you. And so I'm you know, always out there trying to say, I don't want, you don't take more risk than you have to. And that's why you have to do some, you have to do some planning um, to, to try to know what the right number for you is. I say, if Bill Gates walked into my office and said, hey, Roger, you know, heard about you over there in Atlanta. I'm, I'm out of the, uh, I'm not going to give my money away, but I've got this $40 billion. You know, I don't need that much, but what would I do? What should I do? I wouldn't tell him that he needs a 60-40 globally diversified portfolio. I'd tell him, put it all in T-bills and pull out what you need. You know, you don't need to take any risk. Most of us don't have the latitude to take no risk at all. That's, that's really the point, uh, the awareness point that I'm, I'm coming at. So are, are you implying that And I'm going to say it's not a matter of, I don't know whether active is the right term. I think proactively rather than reactively move it when you can afford to move it. And I'll, I'll show you a, a mathematical computation to try to help answer that question. Um, but it, it, I think it's inaccurate to say that an asset allocation today is good for the rest of your life. Uh, it, it does need to change, and it should be changing. All variables being equal, it should be getting more conservative over time. The, uh, the, the fifth risk is health care costs. This is really those long-term care costs. That once again, 10 years ago, you, you didn't have to, to worry about it. Fidelity did some work to say that a couple retiring at 65 uh, we'll need $160,000 to supplement Medicare and other uh, out-of-pocket health care costs. A couple retiring at 60 should uh, plan on $210,000 because they're retiring pre-Medicare. You know, I don't know what the right answer is in terms of health care costs because, one, I don't think it's very easy to project what they're going to be and what the rate of inflation is going to be. I think the, the awareness point for this risk is it's just going to be a reality that health care costs can blow apart a retirement budget. And knowing that this may surprise you on the tail end of a retirement is, is the, the point here. The numbers that I came up with um, came from what the, the cost of an average uh, private room long-term health care stay would be in an a Atlanta health care facility, because you've got $168 per diem rate the average 
period in a, in a long-term care facility, 2.4 years and then 365 days gets you to this 147,168. So of a husband and wife, if one of them requires long-term care and they stayed for the average period of time, that would be the cost. Now, how do you address that cost? Well, that's later on. You can either self-insure it or you can look at long-term care. And long-term care insurance is not cheap. It's hard to pay for because it's kind of like paying for any other insurance that you may never use and hope you don't use. But if, if this is going to imperil the retirement of the, the second spouse, it's something at least to look at because that's where the risk is. If you have a, a husband and wife, you may be able to self-insure for the first period of care and pay privately for the care that's required, but it may reduce the resources available for the surviving spouse, and that may not be the right, the right answer. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say health care is just one of those areas where n nobody's got a good answer in terms of how to project. I, I think there's a, a, a change in financial planning that's coming, and unfortunately the technology doesn't help us do this yet, which is thinking about phased retirement. You have a period of time where you're, you spend more money because you're healthy and there are things you want to do and you can. Then you go into a phase where you just, you've done what you wanted to do. You're not spending as much. And then there'll be a final phase where you're spending more than you anticipated because of health care costs. Problem is trying to figure out where those break points are are extremely difficult. Yes? Have you taken into account, I mean, health care reform? No. This class act? <laughs> Different modalities instead of doing the old fashioned way right. where the providers control the consumer directed model. So it really changes. It, that's the problem. It's changing. I don't know what the answer is. I've heard since the, the Health Care Act was passed, I've had I've been in presentations with, you know, three different consulting firms who at some point in the presentation get to the point and go, we don't know what this means, and I don't think anybody knows what it, it means as to, and, and see, those discussions really are talking about healthcare costs. Here, I'm kind of focusing on long-term care costs, which are a whole different animal because this is not, long-term care, nursing home care, assisted living care is not a part of the healthcare reform discussion, I don't think, you know? Well, the class act really is the Yeah, okay. yeah, so. I. I, this is one I just don't have an answer for. I can, I, can, I can put my finance accounting hat, look at history, and I can come up with an answer in terms of what I think is a reasonable way to approach asset allocation. I don't have a good answer for this one other than to say explore long-term care if you're concerned about it. Don't be surprised by the cost of it, and it may be a decision where you say, you know, we'll, we'll just assume that risk. But at least you know, it's not a surprise. And sometimes you find children are willing to uh, pay a long-term care premium expense because they don't want to have to be concerned about the possible risk of their parents needing that care and not being able to afford it. So I think we'll see a lot of different, different dynamics going on as we try to deal with this. So, so uh, to the, to the implementation part of how to think about some of these issues. Um, I've got a, this is my, my quick and, and dirty retirement planning, how do you do it? And this applies pre-retirement um, and near around retirement. Post-retirement, you find some of the variables you can't do anything about. So um, it's, it's, it's uh, more of an exercise to see are you okay and then trying to fix that can be could be perhaps problematic. But here's all retirement planning from a financial standpoint comes down to be. What cash flow, what income do you need? What fixed cash flow resources do you have available to meet that need? For most, there will be some gap that has to be met up by portfolio withdrawals or nest egg withdrawals. And then you come up with the best way to, to access those withdrawals. So, Keeping in mind some of the, the math we were talking about before, 
Um, if you're pre-retirement trying to think about, okay, how much am I going to spend in retirement? I usually find it's best to not use those rules of thumb of some, some fraction of your expenses, but go with what you have, um, what you're spending now, and then make adjustments for things that you can reasonably project, healthcare, relocation, travel, um, you know, everybody has a, a, a different uh, set of, of uh, goals and objectives they have, but you want to take those into account. You just don't want to assume that they're going to happen because, um, uh, because you want them to. So filling the gap, like I say, comes from your nest egg. So I'm going I'm to skip past this and get to, to the, the, an example. If you've got a need of $10,000 and you've got $3,000 of, of sources of income, wherever it's coming from, um, mm -hmm. rental income, pension income, it, it's something that's, that's relatively fixed. Social Security, and there's a whole level of debate, and I can't answer, is Social Security going to be here? But um, I think it, it will be for the foreseeable future. But it gives you a gap, all right? So uh, a monthly gap of $7,000 is an annual get, uh, need of $84,000 to come from the portfolio. So if you think back to our 4.25% our example, what that would imply mathematically is that you need a nest egg, and this is once again for a 30-year retirement that is balanced between stocks and bonds of around little shy of $2 million to, to meet that gap that you need to generate what's not coming from regular sources of income. So like I was saying, you could get pretty close by saying $50,000 uh, per million as well. Um, this becomes a starting point to know whether you're anywhere close to, uh, to generating enough income because if you don't go through this exercise, you, you, you just don't have any idea. It's too hard to know what does it take to generate this. And if you think back to the numbers of, of what people thought they needed to have in retirement, if they did some planning, they ended up with a bigger expectation here, which leads to a greater likelihood of success in either saving for it or, or accumulating it. So how do you get this? And somebody asked me a question before the, uh, the session about, um, uh, I think it was guaranteed growth annuities, and I, I don't actually know that phraseology, but uh, there are a whole level of different types of annuities out there to um, use to generate an income stream. I, my preference is this idea of total return paycheck replacement, and all that means is you don't lock it up in an annuity because of the, the downsides of an annuity. The downside of, of total return paycheck replacement is you don't have the certainty of an annuity uh, because as, in very simple terms, an insurance company will take a lump sum that you give them and give you an income stream. Um, the downside to that, I think I just listed these. The downside to that is there may not be anything left when you, when you pass away and you're not that the insurance company keeps what's left. Once the money's in there, you lose the flexibility of doing other things with it. And if you look at annuities and they have any level of inflation adjustment in them, it can be quite expensive in terms of how those products are structured. So it, there is just a, a ton of people out there trying to sell different flavors of annuities. When I think of annuitization, a fixed annuity is what we're talking about. It's the cleanest form of, of an annuity. It's very much like if you annuitize the TIAA uh, portion, that's an income stream that you can, you can rely upon. The other annuities that you hear talked about, variable annuities, equity indexed annuities, probably the, the, anything that has a guarantee in it, um, would not be the type of annuity that I would recommend you take a look at just because every time I've looked at those, the costs embedded within these annuity products are, uh, I would say, uh, a detriment 
to successful retirement planning. Uh, let, me, let me back up. What I mean by total return paycheck replacement just means that if you think about that, you set up a portfolio that's 50-50 of stocks and bonds. Over any period of time, you're going to generate some amount of interest, some amount of dividends, and, and over a reasonable period of time, there'll be some growth to the principal with that, that portfolio, that nest egg. The idea is once you come up with what's the right amount to come out of that, say it's whatever the 4.25% uh, generates, you have that automatically come out into wherever you want to spend from. So you're replacing a paycheck by having an automatic income stream so you don't have to think about it. As you pull that liquidity out, obviously you've got to replace that liquidity. And the way you replace that liquidity is just have a disciplined mechanism for, for pulling out of either the stock portion or the bond portion to keep that allocation the way it should be. So if stocks have run up and they're now 60-40 and you need to take liquidity out, even if stocks are still going up, the discipline says sell enough stocks to get you back to 50-50 and, and uh, use that for your liquidity. Next time you may be pulling it from bonds. But that keeps you from getting too out of, um, too emotional about what the markets are doing in terms of how portfolio performance is experiencing itself. So I find that for, for these long periods of time, and still maintaining flexibility, this is the best way to set up that, that income stream. And you can set it up so, it, like I say, it automatically direct deposits just like a paycheck from wherever you've got your, uh, your portfolio set up. It's math, you can, you can do it. If you, if you simply, um, if you simply look to rebalance back to what allocation is the right allocation. You, you can do it yourself. And if you use, and I'll just simplify, if you put everything in certain types of uh, in investments, like a, you know, a balance, just to simplify, a balanced uh, mutual fund, and you can find index-based balanced mutual funds, if you take money out of there, it kind of automatically rebalances itself. So that's one way to do it. Now, could you do it? cheaper because there's some cost to having that balanced mutual fund. Yeah, you could, but at some level, you've just got to be comfortable with how good are you at being disciplined about doing that. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, as, on the, um, as you're filling this gap and you have uh, your income that you were generating from rents or whatever, yes, sir. Uh, too, and then you come up with the portion that you want to pull out of your portfolio for your investment money, the, um, do you consider the interest and the dividends uh, that maybe your uh, investment portfolio is putting off every, mm -hmm. every month or every year as part of the no. income or as part of No, that's where the total return comes from. Okay. Total return is the total return off that nest egg. And it's going to be interest, it's going to be dividends, and it's going to be appreciation over time, hopefully. Uh, so no, I'm thinking about things like rents, pensions, social security, uh, not investment income. And that's where um, you try to simplify it as much as you can because it's easy to get lost in, in um, you know, what is, what, what is this income? What, what's the nature of it? But I'm, the interest, dividends, and growth are the total return component that I'm referring to. And depending on what cycle we're in, those proportions change. Right now, interest is relatively low, you know, at least for the last two years, the, the appreciation portion has been relatively high, dividends have been relatively high, but that constantly changes. <coughs> but if the numbers don't work, and this is when I'm, you know, talking to somebody who's, say, 55, and, and I, you know, there are only so many things you can do. Retiring later makes the biggest impact if you've got time saving more. Generating some income in retirement or spending less and then addressing the longevity issue. I never find anybody wants to, to take that one, but I have had, and it's always men, it's never women. I have had uh, a couple men say, you know what, you're not giving me enough to spend on going out to 95. My family's never lived past 
82, I'll sign something that says, you know, use the assumption that I'm going to die by, you know, 82. Okay, you know, but if we, but if we get there, you're still going to be mad if you're still alive, you know, <laughs> and broke. So here, here's the things to think about. There are things you can control and things you can't control in this whole dynamic of financial planning. You can control, if you've got the time, you can control savings, you can control the asset allocation, you can control the retirement withdrawals. You may or may not be able to uh, control the retirement income if you have the ability through consulting or part-time work to generate uh, additional uh, income. But what you can't control, and, and we spend so much time trying to, 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 to control these, life expectancy is going to be what it is. I mean, you can control that on the margins, but it's going to be what it's going to be. The market we spent all this CNBC time trying to figure out what the market's going to do. You don't know what the market's going to do. And I guess I should, nobody's asked about gold or anything like that, so I'll go ahead and say what I've finally taken my position to be when somebody asks about gold or the, you know, end of the capitalist system or, you know, why you have money in the stock market, it's a rigged game. Here's the deal. Capitalism either works or it doesn't work. And if you come to the conclusion <coughs> rightly or wrongly, works for you. If capitalism is not where you know, the future lies, you should not be investing in the stock market. You should be investing in gold, in bottled water, in land, in firearms, in anything else that, that addresses that scenario. But I think that's such a low probability scenario that I think you're giving up the returns that capitalism, i.e. the stock market and the bond market, can offer in order to make a retirement plan work. So if you're going to agree that the world is not going to come to an end and capitalism is not going to completely collapse and fail, well then you're back to making decisions about what you can control and what you can't control. And you can't control the market. You can't control inflation. You may or may not be able to control health care costs. I, I, I admit it, I, I don't have a good answer for that one. But don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the market's going to do or what inflation's going to do. You'll never, you'll never know. Yes, sir? But you've got to have something for planning. So you think it's reasonable to say over a long horizon you can look for 2% above inflation from this area or 3%? What, what number do you use as a planning level? Uh, if if, if I had to say what's a 60-40 portfolio going to do over a reasonable period of time, I think it's in the 7 to 8 percent range before factoring in uh, taxes and inflation. So that gets you to roughly a real return of about 3 percent. So. Here's another thing. for for. We don't think about it much, but all of the things we've talked about are much easier if your financial situation is simplified. So if you can get to the point where you have the minimum number of account relationships that you can possibly have, one checking account, one taxable brokerage account, because you have to break it up individually, his and her IRAs, his and her Roth IRAs, if his and her SEP IRAs if, if you have those, his or her uh, 401ks or 403bs, the minimum amount that you can have makes all of this a whole lot easier. The other thing I would say is things like individual stock certificates and all that, you want to get those in a brokerage account. You don't want those sitting around. It, all of those things that add complexity make it harder to keep control of what's really important. So, you know, I just, and God forbid if something were to happen to you, your family would be a lot less you know, negative about the whole experience, trying to figure out where everything is. Because so many times I'll see situations where somebody comes in and they have seven different IRAs at seven different brokerage firms, and there's just no reason to have that. You know, find one that you like working with and put everything there. I touched on, diver I touched on diversification. In, in my mind, simplified diversification means you've got <laughs> large and small U.S. stocks, you have U.S. bonds, you have international stocks, and you have cash. Um, you can accomplish some of these or all of these in, in one fund if you want to, to, uh, to aggregate it that way. Take some of the fun out of it, but you can do that. 
you, you can add other asset classes and they may help. It's real hard to quantify exactly how much adding some of these more esoteric alternatives adds, but. Cash. You always, you gotta, always got to have liquidity. I mean, if you're looking at your overall allocation, you've got to have some liquidity. That's not cash for trading in and out purposes. That's cash for liquidity purposes. So I pulled this off just this morning. Uh, uh, Smart Money Magazine, they've got these different portfolios. And, you know, this would fit a 50% stock, 30% bond, 10% alternative. And that's probably going to be something like a, a, a real estate. Uh, investable real estate, you know, a REIT, and then 10% cash. You can make it 55% stocks, 5% cash. You can make it zero alternatives and put all that in bonds. There's no, no magic to it. The point is, it's not all in one basket. It's not uh, lacking in diversification. Because if you use those index funds or the appropriate alternatives that are out there in stocks, bonds, alternatives, you can get plenty of diversification, appropriate diversification pretty easily and inexpensively. Uh, I'm just gonna look ahead because we're starting to run out of time. The, uh, the five years that I was thinking about, as best you can, if you've got time before retirement or you're into retirement, the most important thing you can do, I think, before retirement is test drive. You know, think about what is what does retirement, what's it going to look like financially? What's it going to look like from where I'm going to be, lifestyle, how I spend my time? And then once you're into it, monitor those withdrawals. The couple I met with yesterday, we've, we've done this over time and it's the right way to do it. We've changed that withdrawal rate because they went from pre-retirement, they sold a business or shut down a business. They, um, they've retired and you know what they were saying yesterday is, you know what, we enjoy doing the things we do and we're just spending more money. Can we afford to take more money out? It's like, yes, we can. Now, two years ago when we had the same discussion, when I was having discussions with clients and they would say, hey, can I do this home renovation? Can I buy this new car? I would say, you know, if it's discretionary, I'd hold off because we don't know what's going on with the market right now. That's a part of monitoring withdrawals. Right now, it's different. If you've been deferring off getting that car or doing that remodeling, you know, it, it, we built that cushion back up that we might have eaten down into and you can start doing that again. This is that proactive part of it. It's, it's being aware of what's involved in, in financial planning in, in tracking what you've got. And I'm not big on, I say, I've got budget here. I'm not big on budgets. I think of it as spending plans. How do you spend money? I don't really care about individual line items. I don't do it, I don't do it myself. But my simple budget is if you're not incurring debt then your budget probably works, you know. Um, for somebody early in the process, I say, you need to do this kind of planning to develop a savings goal, so you should be saving, and if you're not going into debt, you're doing okay. Doesn't matter how you spend whatever's in between. Let's see. Let's say everything, you know, things are going well. This is, this is getting into to that idea of, okay, you've got more than enough. <coughs> what should you think about doing? Doing things for, for family, 529s, I think, are a, a great tool for, um, for the next generation or the next generation after that because you can do that in a, uh, in a very uh, gift tax, estate tax, income tax efficient way. And if you're able to uh, uh, address philanthropic desires, these are things that people just tend to miss, using don't, uh, donating appreciated securities. If you've got appreciated securities, and even with what's gone on the past <coughs> few years, you know, many people do, don't give cash, give appreciated securities. Uh, donor advised funds, I'm not a big fan of private foundations. That, that's, that's more complication than most people need. You can accomplish <laughs> the same thing with a donor advised fund, which is just a vehicle for getting a donation, and then you can actually give the money distribute the money on your own schedule. So things to think about in terms of, hey, all the numbers work, we've got excess. Well, what do we do? Because like I said, if you've got excess, actually the first thing you could think about doing is reducing the risk of your portfolio. If you have more than you need and you've got a 60-40 portfolio mix, 
Maybe you can switch it to 4060. If the numbers still work for you, then you can start thinking about doing other things. Um, Dr. Frank mentioned this, you know, uh, encouraging family communication and looking at these things early. Actually talking to uh, children about doing their own financial planning makes it easier to approach your own financial planning because the issues that everybody deals with are the same, they just come at different times. And some of the biggest challenges that we're seeing right now are clients who are in a situation where they're concerned about their parent situation and they're dealing with their children. And so the idea of having communication about retirement makes all of this easier for everybody. And for whatever reason, that's something we don't like to talk about in terms of you know, telling our family, here's our situation, here's where things are. Um, but you're, doing, you're leaving a tremendous legacy if, uh, for, uh, for that next generation if you go through the process of communicating about these issues. Like I said, I'll send this, uh, this is a part of what uh, should have been in the presentation. These are just some, some uh, books and a couple web resources that I think are, are good. Um, the AICPA actually has some pretty good resources available to the public. Um, this, this financial decisions guide is actually an end of life planning guide. It helps think through those um, ideas of, okay, if I'm not here, what would I have liked to put down on paper for who I left behind uh, to know about? And then this 360financialliteracy.org is just kind of a one-stop shop for, uh, for uh, financial topics. So th there are plenty of things to, uh, to draw from that. I, I badmouth CNBC, but there are some good resources out there. Smart Money, which is a part of the Wall Street Journal family, uh, along with Barron's and the like. Smart Money, I think, is the best of all of them in terms of personal finance issues. Um, Barron's not so much. Wall Street Journal is, is probably next after Smart Money. But I think they do a pretty good job of covering some of these topics in the appropriate level of depth. <coughs> um, it's uh, 5.20. I'm going to stop there and take any questions that we haven't been able to, to cover. Um, I'll just say quickly, because we didn't, didn't get to it, uh, I, I touched on it briefly. My idea of um, where financial markets are now is I think we'll find, as more academic work is done, that 2008 and early 2009 were critical in terms of whether uh, uh, capitalism was going to survive. Um, it did, and I think it's probably the better for it in terms of what the, the future looks like. Um, but it was an, an interesting time, but when you look at the fundamentals now, there's definitely a recovery in place, and I don't care what happens to Gaddafi or what happens uh, to, uh, uh, in the Middle East, obviously you have to be concerned about oil, but the fundamental recovery in the United States seems to be pretty well entrenched with the example of, with the exception of two big gorillas in the room, unemployment and housing. And we seem to be dealing with the recovery with unemployment still um, unusually high and housing is just going to be a long, slow slog. It still doesn't seem like it's going to cause any, any double dip because it can't go anywhere. <coughs> so with that cheery note, I'll stop there. <laughs> watch up here. Um, well, it's time to wrap it up, folks. By the way, one of the things we've done is I have a 10-page memo that my daughters get, an attorney gets, and a CPA gets. doesn't say what the assets are, but it says where everything in sight is, right down to the file drawers and the file folders. So if my wife and I aren't around, my children have a chance to find out what the facts are and where they are. Otherwise, they'll be lost. And I've been doing that like 10 or 15 years. At any rate, thank you. I hope it's been helpful.
The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.